Can you imagine Bloodborne 2? A few months ago, I put two and a half grand on offer to help artists bring their vision to life. Some took us to the deep seas, and some took us to the heavens. Some kept it really faithful, they built upon the foundations of Yharnam, and others took risks, taking us to western settings, eastern settings, Aztec Laran, Sesame Street. View enough entries like this, and you'll start to grow some eyes on the inside, I'm telling you. But before we begin, for the very first time, I'd like to reveal Soul Arts, a tribute to all of the most outstanding pieces contributed to these art competitions. The cover art is by Ricardo Amike, and it shows all of our artists clawing for a top position, pouring their souls onto the canvas. See if you can spot all the little character references. One day soon, we hope to bring Soul Arts to Kickstarter, so please keep an eye out for that. Now though, it's time for the top 10. So let's begin in Laran. This sand-swept, stormy labyrinth is one of Bloodborne's most signature chalice dungeons. Many artists expanded the world of Bloodborne in this direction, including Rex Beck, who designed a boss, a dark beast named Khan Kur, who was left behind to guard the gateway as his masters retreated further underground. He appears still, statuesque, surrounded by a ring of candles and the bones of former offerings. All manner of creatures kneel before him, worshipping at a safe distance. Only when you step beyond the candle ring does he finally move. But he is stuck in the doorway, so the first phase of the fight has you chipping away at his arms, as the fleshy growths on the walls threaten to drag you towards him. After a certain amount of damage, Kankur becomes enraged, flaying himself as he tears through the doorway. With electrified wings created by ripped skin and viscera, the fight begins in earnest. When the boss is slain, the flesh covering the doorway withers, letting through this rush of stagnant, filthy air. Now you're free to discover what truly became of the ancient people of Laran, and you receive this cute cosmetic item for your messengers for your troubles. Next, we go Seaborn. The way Zachary introduces his entry is really powerful. We see a ship being pulled into a maelstrom, followed by a man on a beach, with the wreckage of countless ships behind him. This high-backed chair is actually a reference from one of Bloodborne's alpha tests, a warp chair where characters once took their rest. Aye, let me guess, your ship got snatched up by a foul storm, pulled down to the darkest depths. In that case, I'm afraid your crew went down with the ship. You should consider it a mercy, really. Something about this place. Well, you can't sleep. Not ever. So I sit here, very, very quietly, in a sort of sleepless dream. As for me confederates, well, you'll see. Here, take my hook safe and my pistol. You'll be needing them more than I. The weapons themselves play into the crude yet crafty tools of a pirate. The hook safe is a sickle with a detachable pommel that can be swung around in tandem with the blade. In your other hand is Herman's harpoon pistol, which syncs well with the high mobility of a Bloodborne game because it allows you to repel between enemies in a fight. You'll use these weapons to take out the pale blood priests, islander cultists that have been transformed by their devotion to the moonless child. They search unendingly for precious blood to nourish their decrepit god, and when they've sucked enough blood, they will swell and harden into a cocoon-like state, emerging as a proto-amygdala soon after. Number 8. Yong Yi Li In his vision of Bloodborne 2, you awaken, and you immediately face off against a boss. This is the descendant of a great one part beast, part celestial, attacking you with a combination of attacks, like the Nightmare Tail Blades, a ghostly extension of its forked tail. Towards the end of the fight, the Great One evolves, or devolves really, into Afrida, a descendant of the Pharaoh. She's becoming more human, and she appears to have lost a lot of her ranged cosmic attacks as a result of that, so instead she throws her surrogate children at you. These children trip you up, they slow you down, and some even erupt in blood spikes if you get too close. When you defeat her, she devolves fully back to a human, and her heart reveals that she is something of an experiment, half beast, half celestial, much like yourself. 
You inspect your own body afterwards and you discover one arm encrusted with coral and barnacles and the other being wrapped and sprouting hair. You feel power surging from both arms, but each of them feel drastically different, as if they are of two worlds, one high above ground and the other deep below the ocean. This allows you to make use of the ancient axe Kopesh, which is the star of Yong's entry. The Kopesh is a quick slashing weapon that can be slid into the axe head for more devastating heavy attacks. The detail on the axe head is amazing, and the concept is strong. But it gets even better, because you can wield this weapon in Beast Mode or Celestial Mode. If you grasp the Kopesh by the blade and attach the hilt to the axe, then your blood will run down from the blade and activate its Beast Mode. This is now a crescent axe that erupts with blood, and while every swipe reduces your health because you're grabbing the blade, every successful hit actually restores it. If you need even more range, you can activate the Celestial Mode instead, which extends the weapon into this powerful scepter, where you can swing arcane bolts with every strike, and just like its beast equivalent, you can also shorten it down as well. This was such an excellent entry, and honestly, one of the strongest trick weapon designs that you'll see today. Next, we dive into Deepford, an underwater take on Bloodborne by Holdsworth Hands. In this world, hunters expressed a desperate desire to escape the control of the Great Ones above, seeking the refuge offered by the deep seas. Early expeditions failed, hunters were not prepared for the ocean, and the first suits that they made for their journey were clumsy and poorly designed. Over time, they developed these diving bells, aptly named structures that provided a place to breathe and rest on the long descent below. Can we just take a moment to appreciate how genius this design is as a checkpoint? They're a giant bell with a small lamp attached, the inverse of Bloodborne's checkpoints which featured a large lamp with small bells attached. So the hunters adapted, and as they delved deeper they developed helmets that could stand even greater pressures. Let's give a shout out here to the clever designs of these helmets, and to the UI design as well. To their dismay, normal blood vials didn't work underwater, piercing the suit wasn't a good idea, so a special valve and a pressurized blood canister was implemented. Trick weapons are here too, of course. Any objects that they found below were fashioned into weapons, such as Henry's Lost Anchor, which extends via a chain mechanism to form a heavy flail. In order to parry, a harpoon pistol can stun your enemies and pull them to you to perform a visceral attack. These innovations led hunters deeper and deeper, some travelling so far that no one ever saw them again. What did they find in the deepest depths of the ocean? What sort of horrors could stand this darkness, these pressures? You pass many hunters, locked in suits that have become their grave, and there are more and more curiosities below. For the ocean is more ancient than the mountains, and freighted with the memories and the dreams of time. But the deep seas weren't the only places hunters could escape to. Some found refuge in nightmares. This is Carl Hassler's Nightmare Settlement, a small colony for lost souls. Founded by Carol, the first settler, this is a place for hunters to rest, to talk to other refugees, use the workshop, and of course be granted strength in exchange for blood echoes. H.P. Lovecraft wrote amazing stories about the traversal of dreamlands, featuring characters who get lost in a series of unsettling adventures, and I really get that same Lovecraftian sense from this place. As opposed to the hunter's dream, which is small and disconnected, this nightmare settlement feels like it's actually within a wider nightmare world, full of dangers and unfamiliar places. The hunter's dream is safe and cozy, yeah, but this nightmare settlement feels like a safe place in a dangerous world, and I feel like it's all the more striking for it. Within this place, you meet Garad, a hunter by the looks of it. And if you travel back up to Yarnum, you'll find the old city even more difficult to traverse than you remember, as only the fiercest beasts have been able to survive. Pilgrim beasts that echo the design of the cleric beast, a ravenous crows speckled with countless little eyes, and unseen hunters. I feel like this is one of the strongest enemy designs in the whole competition. Your eyes are drawn first to its head, which echoes the design of the moon presence. Next, you dissect that tangle of tentacles to discover that it actually has four smaller arms on top and is supported by one enormous arm below. 
Here your eyes finally fall upon a decapitated wolf's head that lies on the ground. You aren't the only hunter of beasts out tonight. Amazing work. Congratulations to Carl Hassler on sixth place. The next three entries expand upon the stories of the Vilebloods from the original game. As you may recall, the Vilebloods were born when a scholar at Bergenworth brought forbidden blood back to Canehurst Castle. The church considered them a threat to the purity of their blood healing, and the executioners murdered every last Vileblood, except for their queen, who appeared to be immortal. In Janine Maganito's entry, Queen Annalise smiles as she sits patiently in her lonely throne room, and she speaks the words, Canehurst will rise again. For, unbeknownst to the executioners, some Vilebloods managed to escape the massacre by boat. Unfortunately, instead of being reviled for their blood, they actually became hunted for their blood instead. We play as one such Vileblood, no longer a hunter, but the hunted, drinking blood offerings and fending off pirates. The biggest gameplay innovation here are blood weapons, conjurations similar to those used by Lady Maria, which can be used to grab, drag, bind, repost, and even infect enemies. But these aren't the only blood weapons in Janine's entry. There are also two legendary weapons that are forged from the eyes of Vileblood. One day, a sailor met Miari, a Vileblood. She fell in love with the sailor and offered him her blood through her tears. Once the sailor tasted Miari's blood, however, his lust could not be sated. He wanted more. Miari offered him an eye in an attempt to satiate him, and he forged it into an elegant weapon, using its infectious powers to conquer other ships on the seas. Tragically, his renown with this legendary weapon led to rumors about the power of vile bloods, and Miari was hunted down her other eye taken and hastily forged into a crude weapon, which damages both the player and the enemy. Miari was encased in stone, a stone that endlessly produces blood. No one knows if she's still alive in there, waiting to be freed. One location we explore is the town of Aram Maris, which worships the water and all that comes from it. So when the Vilebloods came, corrupting the waters with their blood, the townsfolk were among the most affected, mutating in terrible ways. Janine's approachable, playful art style really shines through. On this slide, she created NPCs that serve as these really memorable merchants, blacksmiths, and characters. Next, returning to the top 10 for the fourth time is Jane Lysa, and as always, she goes above and beyond. In Bloodborne, Queen Annalise partakes in blood drag offerings so that she may one day bear a child of blood. Well, in Jane's entry, we play as that Vileblood child, born with a hunter's instinct from all of the hunter offerings, and born as an immortal, which obviously suits the gameplay of Bloodborne perfectly. The first location we explore is quite similar to the streets of Yarnum, and here, at a lit window, we talk to our first NPC. Two children are behind the window, and they tell a story about their sick mother who desperately needs medicine. Luckily, rich nobles have offered them a great sum of money to dance at their mansion, but we'll get to that later. When you die, you awaken at a hunter's dream. Its atmosphere is familiar, yet its function is different. It operates as an observatory for the stars, with a large telescope that our new maiden makes frequent use of. Unlike previous hub maidens, this one is cheerful, even sarcastic at times. Her design is brilliant, and her attire perfectly captures that Vileblood aesthetic. Since our story revolves around learning more about our origins, the first place we warp to are the Torment Gardens, founded by exiled Vilebloods. Here the nobles drown in sin, caging their victims, draining their blood, and even turning the prettiest ones into dolls. The exiled Vilebloods wish to become great ones, and in this next scene, they put on performances to please Erden, a great one who is interpreted as existing in sound form. Tragically, here we fight the twins that we met earlier in the streets, drained of blood and turned into dolls. The cutscene to follow shows a rune being tattooed on their bodies by someone with very sacred knowledge, and the key that you find here leads you to the next area, the spiritual center. Here, insight starts to play a greater role in the story. A high priestess reads your fortune with tarot cards, offering you the hanged man card, sensing what you're about to witness. The room behind her presents an enormous Ouija board inscribed with runes. The boss name appears, 
and reads Runesmith Carol, who the first game established as the creator of the runes we use. Here, his runes on the battlefield are randomly activated throughout the fight, buffing him with various new strengths as the fight runs long. I love this idea, it would make the boss feel different for everyone who encounters it. At the end, we find a wall where Carol tried to transcribe the utterings of the Great Ones. We touch an Egyptian-looking symbol and we're transported to Laran, where the Queen venerated the old blood and spread the beastly scourge. Her right leg is prosthetic, based on the belief that beast blood creeps up the right leg, but prosthetic legs did nothing to stop the scourge. In fact, the queen came to embrace the old blood, introducing blood rituals to her people and making Laran fall even harder as a result. Later on, we come across a lost beach and an abandoned ship. This is the captain's nightmare, where we learn the truth behind our origins. Turns out, this captain hid you, the child of blood, and then stole away with your mother, Queen Annalise, to draw their enemies away. After defeating the captain, who's lost in this endless nightmare, you open the chest to find queenly flesh, that revivable remnant of Queen Annalise. The first ending of Jane's Bloodborne 2 has you being reborn in the waters surrounding the hunter's dream. However, throughout the game, you might have collected blood ethers, which unlock the second and third endings. These have you either merging with or facing off against your doppelganger, a Great One's projection of yourself, offering incredible power to match your vile blood legacy. The window in the backdrop of this fight represents an iris, and Jane uses it as the central element of her final art piece, which features a plethora of weapons, references, and symbols to represent your journey. Uh, game developers, are you seeing this? Can we get these artists some job offers, please? Moving into the top three, we have Titanilla Pitsfor's City of Vale Danam. This old city was built upon the surface of the sea, which feeds its canals and inspires this sense of Venetian Gothic architecture. The atmosphere in the city is familiar, yet distinct, drawing really clever inspiration from the colourful rice powder wig era of the 18th century, with its carnivals and masquerade balls. It's so genius to pull that era into Bloodborne's unique brand of horror, and it fits the lore here so well too, for Vale de Nam is described as the city of the Vilebloods, who serve as its ruling dynasty. Here, various factions clash, and have clashed in the past, with the executioners of the church, but now a new threat has arisen to drown out the others. One day, as a grand masquerade was being celebrated in the streets of the city, an ancient tide of blood arose and swept over everything, infecting survivors and setting the stage for the Tumerians to emerge from the city's secret catacombs. And the Tumerians seemed to know it was coming. In fact, right before the first tide, a Tumerian noble was blending in with the crowds, seeking blood sacrifices for his masters. With skin resembling a shriveled corpse, he was not exempt from the curse of the old plague, but his hand and weapon fused together in a mass of tentacles that allow him to unnaturally extend his jab. In addition to his mysterious arcane sword that stuns the player if you get hit, he's fond of tossing oil urns at you and then spitting fire at them to turn you into a living bonfire. Finally, an NPC tells you that this noble might visit you in your dreams, and if he catches you in a nightmare, he will catch you in reality. Roaming the streets of Vale de Nam are the humming ladies, young maidens who once longed for love and excitement at the Grand Masquerade. Her presence is indicated by a soft, echoing, melodic humming. She is slow moving, almost gliding on the cobblestones, speeding towards the player with a cage of messengers extended, hoping to lure you in. Her humming becomes louder, and blood orbs shoot towards you unless you close the distance, which will trigger her lightning-fast transformation. Spider legs erupt from below, her body distorts, and the mouth, concealed by her wig, threatens to devour you. She's lightning quick and hungry, but that's her weakness. If you lure her to the corpse of a previously defeated enemy, then she can't help but devour it, giving the player a few seconds of advantage. While she's distracted, throw a Molotov at her, because it's the only time that you'll be able to exploit her weakness to fire. Another enemy that you might hear before you see is the lost servant of Bryzenten, whose chains rankle and clank as he plods throughout the blood-soaked streets. 
crying out in search of his father. He's actually not aggressive, and is able to be passed if the hunter leaves him alone. But if you don't, then you're almost certain to die on your first encounter. Two long arms swipe down at you, two shorter arms attempt to grab you, and his powerful hind legs can propel him above and behind you, where he may sink his pointed teeth into your neck. He is, however, very sensitive to lightning attacks, and if you get him down to a lower health, then he will fight more cautiously, whipping his long neck chain at you from a distance. Of all the entries, Veil de Nam feels the most realistic in terms of what From Software could do with a sequel. It feels familiar, yet distinct, and the gameplay considerations here are just so masterful that I'm honestly kind of gutted that we might never get to explore these Venetian blood-soaked streets. Titanilla has entered multiple past competitions, and it's so well deserved that she's broken the top three here for the first time. Please go and check out her art station in the description. Her character art, as you can tell, is fantastic, and she's currently open for commissions if you want to see more like this. Now, for the very first time, we have a shared first place. Congratulations to Thomas Chamberlain and Sam Lamont. First, let's explore Sam's world. His is perhaps the most outlandish piece in the whole competition. Such was the wonder of blood ministration that we were compelled to bring that knowledge to those unfortunates who live without its miraculous effects. This was the Healing Church's mission, as proposed by Sam Lamont. In his world, the Healing Church sets off to spread their doctrine to the wider world, but on the way, the ships and their passengers are irreversibly changed by the harvesting of chorus whales, whose flesh and blood reveal terrible insights. Now we can see, looking upon the stain of warping death that we leave in our wake, it is not a miracle we bring, but terror and unstoppable ruinous change. Sam's game takes place on these gargantuan ships, which are essentially floating cities that travel as a fleet. The first we row up to is the Fimble Winter, sporting these great lighthouses that shine through the eternal rain and fog. This ship becomes our hub world, but it's also occupied by the Lamplighters, who are these former crew members tasked with maintaining the lighthouse. They were irreversibly changed by the use of oil that was flensed from the great whales. So a sickness took them, and they began staring endlessly into the light, laughing joyously as their transformation began. In-game, they pour oil on you, and then ignite you by spitting a burning liquid from their mouth. So keen are they to watch things burn. Each ship boss drops a phonograph cylinder, which can be used to play songs that control the weather or the tides. Songs of the void change the weather, increasing your likelihood of encountering certain enemies. This adds replay value to each ship. There are also Songs of the Tides, which can be played to bring new ships into your fleet, opening up new areas for exploration. The first to be boarded are the twin ships of Dawn and Dusk, a twisting labyrinth left to rot by its blind inhabitants. Swarms of gulls once circled overhead, but when the plentiful fish they were accustomed to were depleted by the massive boat's endless trawling, the starving gulls pecked and clawed at the fishermen's eyes, blinding each and every one. Who can say how a bird interprets the insights that are gained by so many eyes? Encounter them, and they will vomit hundreds of eyes at the player. If you are hit, the gull's true form can be seen for a fleeting second, which causes massive frenzy damage. In this place, we acquire the Trident Bow, a whale hunting tool turned trick weapon, capable of firing and then reeling in your prey. We also find the Crescent Hook, which can contract into a stabbing weapon, capable of delivering a poisoned jab. Next, the Song of the Waxing Crescent brings us to the Brilliant Communion, a ship reserved for Father Reuben and his clergy. Ironically, it now seems lost to members of the occult. Nuns turned to witches, armed with these enormous flensing shears for skinning the chorus whales. These weapons are incredibly powerful, but their shoddy construction means that once they break, they cannot be repaired and used again. Fall to a flensing witch, and your skin will be added to their cloak, increasing their eldritch powers. 
The whales themselves are hauled onto the Cornucopia, a trawling vessel that was hastily converted to accommodate the whales that crewmen were becoming increasingly dependent on. Their whale skin gave up whale blubber, which permanently increases either your HP or your stamina. Their flensed oil has miraculous healing properties and can burn bright enough to penetrate any fog. Within their bowels was amber grease, with a smell that proved irresistible to most sailors, breaking their minds with terrible insights if they ate it. Finally, the whale songs were inscribed on wax cylinders made of ambergris, so that the songs of the fathomless depths could be played on a phonograph. After being administered with the healing blood, these whales gave up their secrets in flesh, blood, and song, and as you fight one during this boss fight, wounds reveal a cornucopia of eyes underneath, which can blast the player with arcane beams. And when the deed is done, one may fashion a cutlass from a tooth, the natural oils fueling a flame you can tease from its edge. Once the chorus whale is defeated, the player makes their way inside, witnessed by a tunnel of a thousand eyes. Isn't this just the most bloodborne thing you've ever seen? The eyes coalesce into a sea of stars and galaxies, eventually leading to the final area, the city underneath. Here, the true forms of the chorus whales float overhead with an alien grace, circling a spire suggestive of the deep sea rune, where each tower ends with a fight against the heralds, who listen to the rituals being performed above. After the last one is slain, you are transported to a chalice dungeon, surrounded by Tumerians, who speak to you in a language you inexplicably understand. They have answered. You can find more work from Sam over on his website, moonskinned.co.uk, where he's only too happy to give form to expansive worlds, intricate games, and horrifying monsters. He even sells a small set of miniatures in his store, which he thinks should appeal to the Dark Souls fans among us, so please go and check him out in the description. Sharing first place with Sam is Thomas Chamberlain, who masterfully captures the themes, the aesthetics, and also just the design goals of From Software. Injured, you wander the desert, seeking blood healing, until you notice a figure in the distance pulling a makeshift pram. Upon getting closer, they turn to face you, and if you look past the enormous scythe, you may notice something familiar about them right before they cut you to shreds. This is not a fight you're supposed to win, but delay your demise long enough and the figure will use eldritch attacks, granting you some insight to start your journey with. You awaken in the Hunter's Reverie, a sort of daydream equivalent to the Hunter's Dream. I love the color palette and the atmosphere of this place. Patiently waiting as you admire the new dream is the doll. She's no longer hostile to you, but her newfound tendency for violence and conflict does help to explain her newly cracked facade. Doing character development for the doll is a brilliant idea, and it continues as you interact with her. You can ask to look inside her pram, and she'll refuse, but if you keep trying with your weapon drawn, then she will eventually relent. You quickly learn that her warnings are not to be taken lightly, because looking inside will grant you 20 insight, but at the cost of 50% of your maximum health. Attack her, and the doll will ask if you wish to leave this place. Continue, and she'll curtsy, booting you to the main menu screen, which you kind of deserve, let's be honest. On the flip side, you can bring her certain clothes that you find throughout your journey, and for this, she will thank you, and be seen wearing them in subsequent visits. Gaining trust with the doll will reward you with weapons, brooches, and she might even assist you in the final fight. For there is a brooding disturbance in the depths of Loran. The sand is draining away somewhere beneath the city, exposing the sprawling ruins. The city is crawling with Ixodida, giant ticks that languish in the exposed sun. They're your primary source of blood, provided you have a cannula to inject with. Different types of cannula can be found throughout your journey, and these injection vessels change the type of healing you receive. For example, some replenish more HP, but slowly, and some replenish less HP, but quickly, and some offer buffs to damage, speed, or defense. This is such a good idea. Your garb also suits the setting, and you'll soon find a fantastic trick weapon to match, the Tendon Saber. 
A hooked weapon, it's designed to sever the Achilles tendon. It has a contracted one-handed state for grappling with enemies in close range, and an extended two-handed form intended for long-range defensive combat. It's the weapon our character wields against the Ixodida Queen, an enormous tick that towers over you looking for an opening as you're swarmed by its spawn. As long as the smaller ticks can be taken out carefully, they can be a source of healing for the player, but carelessness fighting the minions might put you in range of the queen, whose mouth has this devastating grab attack. There are two ways you can progress the fight. The queen has high health regeneration thanks to her huge store of blood, but it's possible to overwhelm her with enough consistent damage. Alternatively, you can repeatedly attack her blood sac until it ruptures, lowering her health regeneration with each wave of toxic blood. In her fully depleted state, her blood sac is horrifically severed, and she lets out a nauseating shriek, scaring away the lesser Ixodida and rushing you in a frenzy with drastically increased movement and attack speeds. But no matter which combat approach you take, if you risk focusing your attacks on her mouth, then you'll eventually be rewarded with the Ixodida Queen Hyperstone. It's a trick weapon crafted from her remains, capable of shooting out this lightning fast whip to impale enemies, allowing you to drain them of their blood, just as she does. Thomas also drafts four other trick weapons, all sporting consistently strong designs, the pincer shears, the leeching Yurumi, the ceremonial pick, and the feral Makwahuit. As you explore the city, the eclipse overhead progresses, and your insight deepens. As a result, enemies get harder, different enemies seem to show up, and you also start to notice visual cues that help you perfectly time your dodges, which is similar to what we received as a gameplay innovation in Sekiro. I love this. I love that he tied it into insight as well. Anyway, in this place, you speak to the inhabitants of Loran, who are hiding away in their homes. There's talk of a queen. Some implore you to trust her a little longer, and some ramble about her dooming us all. There are violent members of an insurrection on the streets, and who you decide to side with plays into the side stories of the city, opening up helpful shortcuts or providing rare resources. So you fight your way to the deepest depths, and you finally reach the altar of the lost ocean. A great one sits upon the altar, holding some bloodied remains wrapped in swaddling cloth. You approach, realizing the bodies bent in prayer are long since desiccated, crumbling at your touch. At the altar is another powerful healing item, the Queen's Cannula, which reads, The people were ailing, plagued by disease and drought. A great power was offered by the Tumerian priest, a ritual that when complete could deliver her poor Lorenites from their torment. She would never come to learn the true horror she had unwittingly brought upon the world, an unending curse of defilement and death. Taking this item drives the Great One into a frenzy, breaking the altar apart and throwing you into the abyssal water below. As with many great bodies of water in Bloodborne, when you hit it, you are transported into a nightmare. And on your way back up to the surface in this realm, you also encounter the townsfolk running in fear or undergoing hideous transformations. And at the surface, you start your final fight with Fauna, the Great One of Loran. In Bloodborne, it was speculated that our moon presence was called Flora, based on some dialogue from the doll. Flora is a technical term for plant life, and fittingly, the Great One of Loran is called Fauna, the technical term for animal life. So considering Loran is famous for having its own beastly scourge, Fauna is an excellent name. After the nightmare is slain, the city seems to be at rest. Now that you have the knowledge and the tools required for blood healing, you travel home to your settlement and part ways with the doll. On your way out, if you have enough insight, you see the doll push her pram up an altar to meet with Fauna, who is seemingly still alive. As Fauna descends, the doll gently waves goodbye, and they both disappear from sight. The end. What I love about Thomas Chamberlain's entry are the questions that are left unspoken. As Bloodborne fans, a lot of you can probably guess, uh, for example, what was in the doll's pram. You can probably see why she's wielding a scythe. You might figure out why the Great One is wearing a wedding ring and why it's cradling an infant. Thomas doesn't explicitly explain these things. Instead, he respects your intelligence and your curiosity with the way that he presents them. and. That is the most From Software-like trait of them all. Thomas is currently a concept artist over at Playground Games, and his professional background shows, honestly. 
His take on the run would be an excellent foundation for a team that's looking to build out gameplay, level design, and lore. So if you're looking to learn, Thomas has a YouTube channel where he details the processes behind a lot of his art, and he's even given a long interview detailing all of the lore and design decisions behind this piece in particular, which I really recommend you watch. So please check out all of his links, including his art station, in the description. Congratulations to everyone who competed. It's a huge privilege to receive and review your art. And even if your piece wasn't seen here, I hope you enjoyed the creative process of competing in the competition. Uh, before you go though, let's talk about some of these runner-ups. The most difficult thing about these competitions is choosing who makes it into the top 10 and who misses out. Uh, luckily, since an art book is being made from these entries, it's my hope that that book will do a lot of justice to a lot of the unseen art and artists. That said, runners-up for this competition included Pierre, who was perhaps the only one to present Bloodborne with a Spanish flair, with weapons and attire to match. Wes Fraser, whose greenhouses filled with healing herbs were decommissioned after the healing blood took over, only to be recommissioned in the hopes of transcending humanity through the Lumen Woods. Neda offered a convincing story that I thought would make excellent DLC, featuring Edward of the Moon and his many weapons. Mark took Bloodborne to a forested cove, which was settled by Bergenworth scholars, uh, who later became ruled by pirates and their terrible captain. John Bick, whose 3D renders were unparalleled in this competition, uh, he took us to the Hinterlands, a murky wetland full of decay and rot. Benjamin proposed a vampiric flair for his sequel, with our character discovering the corruption within Salvin Castle. This entry was so close to making it in. Nolan created the best underwater concept from a gameplay point of view, with the actual currents being controllable by the player, getting around the sluggishness of underwater combat. Felix offered an excellent perspective on a hub world with their art. Uh, there was Ab and Rain, who are always on the very brink of the top 10. They presented a set of factions that were really very convincing. Andrew Mironov set up characters that fused Bloodborne's aesthetic with the World War. Angel created a really stylish cast of characters, placing really high as always. Augusto crossed Bloodborne with a knightly aesthetic, which looks awesome. Elena created a really memorable boss called the Bloated Cardinal. I'll always remember the Spring-Heeled Jack from Harrison's super detailed entry. There was Ian's retro aesthetic, Jiwen's awesome painted style, Maxime envisioned Carol as an owl, Xiaofan created a awesome aesthetic inspired by Chinese folklore. Askan took us to the Western Gold Rushes, where miners found and became obsessed by a very different kind of metal. And Aaron proposed a haunting ritual for his piece, showing a group chanting an ode to the Great One. Now, there's also two other entries that absolutely would have made the top 10, but weren't eligible because they were actually created before the competition was announced. Uh, these are shots from Kredishan Astani's Blood Maidens and Toby Trebeljar's Oceanborn, and they're astounding. I hope they accept a feature in the art book. But the final uneligible entry is by Ricardo Amike, who opted not to return as a judge for this competition simply because he wanted to contribute one last thing. It's a series of art masterpieces put to video and it serves as a very fitting end to our competition. So thank you everyone for being a part of this. Maybe one day we'll return for a second season, but for now, enjoy One Ironaut by Ricardo Amike. Yes, indeed. <laughs> they call it the Oneronaut. The wondrous device. The grand one. Line between. 
between the dreams blur. And when the red tide comes, the waters rise, and all will be taken by the end most night. Those who walk the lucid lane, trying to wake themselves by raising Cain. The bourgeoisie, immaculate. creation, lonely stands a galvanist, trying to reanimate a wilting flower smith. See? 